Well, we're continuing in our lesson. We're only in, I don't know how many lessons we've had. We had 13, and then we went into COVID, obviously, and we took a time off for about, what, six, seven months, and then we came back, and I think in September, October, had to review for about four or five lessons in order to catch us up, and now we're moving on. <clears throat> and we've been talking about the essentials of the love of God. And, and I want to always remind this. In order to biblically understand, in order to biblically understand God's love, we must make sure that we connect or equate God's love, that attribute which is essential to his being, God is not God apart from his love. Amen? So this is essential. It's not something just added to him. And in order to understand this essential attribute of God's love, we must understand it within the context and in association with the other essential attributes of God. Now, if you're not sure what all that means, whatever, you just really have to go back, I think, on YouTube or wherever all these are, somewhere out there in video land and look it up and look at these because very much misunderstanding about God's love, what he will do and what he will not do and what he should do and what he should not do and is this God's love and is that not God's love and so on. Most of it has to do with either a non-understanding or a weak understanding of God's love in association with all of his other essential attributes, these attributes that cause God to be who he is. Apart from any of these attributes, God simply isn't God. He's not God if he's not omnipotent, omniscient, immutable, sovereign, correct? And so it's important to do that. So we're now talking about the love of God, which is the love within God among the three persons of the Trinity, this intra-Trinitarian love, which is manifested and given to humanity in the incarnation of the Son of God. When the Son of God takes on a human body and soul, Jesus brings to us, unites the love of God in himself into a man sets it in a man, this man called Jesus, and Jesus takes upon himself, remember, all the sin of his people and dies to pay that price in order that this love of God by the Holy Spirit can be given to us when the Holy Spirit brings us into the kingdom of God through our new birth, correct, which we receive by faith. And so now each one of us who are believers, each one of us, has the love of God in himself or in herself. That means this, that we actually have deposited into us, planted into us the very love that exists among the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The very love with which Jesus loved the Father, which the Father loved the Son, and which the Holy Spirit loves the Father and the Son. That very love is where today? Where? In us. Therefore, the glory of God is in us. The glory of who God is as manifested in his Son and given to us as a gift through grace. Now, we're talking about now the manifestation of this intrinsic, intrinsic love of God. We're talking about the manifestation or the outworking of that love in us, his people. How does he do it and what will it look like? So that's where we are right now. So last lesson we saw that the Holy Spirit has planted the seed. Why do I say seed? The seed of God's love. Remember the seed of the woman. In Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman, who is whom? Who is who? Christ. Christ is the seed of the woman. The seed of Abraham, Galatians 3.16, the seed of, the, uh, of Abraham, that is Christ, Paul says. So the Holy Spirit has planted this seed or has planted the very life and love of God in Christ 
in us by giving us the Holy Spirit. And so, however, this seed has been planted, remember, into corrupt bodies. We have fallen bodies. Anyone think you don't have a fallen body? Anyone experience aches and pains? Anyone experience kind of you're not the same today as you were 30 years ago? We have fallen bodies. We have bodies which are under the domination of sin. That's who we are, our human bodies, and our minds are fallen. They're corrupt. We know that. They're darkened. The Bible tells us these things. But the seed, the seed of God's love, you see what I'm saying? I'm the seed of God's love, the seed of Jesus, Jesus' own love. I'm mixing all of this up so we can get a broader picture. The seed of God's love is planted, if you would, into the soil or into the garden of our minds, causing our minds now to begin to become the garden of God. So this means that our natural minds must be renewed. They must be renewed by the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. We saw that in Romans chapter 12. Remember, present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, which is a reasonable service of worship. And don't be conformed to this fallen world, but be you what? Transformed by the renewing of your minds that we may be able to prove that will of God, which is perfect. And so now... God has planted the seed of eternal life, the very presence of his own love, where? Into the soil of our minds, into the soil of these bodies. Because I think for most of us, our minds are in our bodies. Isn't that true for most of us? Okay. Now, what has to happen now is that this transforming work has to occur as the Holy Spirit begins to cultivate the garden. He has to cultivate. He has to prune. He has to do whatever is necessary to cause the seed or the seeds, if you would, talking about, you know, in a uh, way of thinking about the garden, cultivating these seeds, these plants to grow in us so that we can become the productive garden of God, so that when people look at our lives, they can marvel over the glory and the wonder of this great gardener, that they can have their breaths taken away when they see this is what the gardener has done in such a pile of mess, so that the garden, gardener will receive the glory, will receive the praise for this. And so the seeds or the flowers or the fruit of this planting are described in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. The primary seed being what? The fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. So let me share with you a picture first as we move into the first two descriptions of God's love. And let's keep this picture in mind as an overview or as a motivational understanding of what's happening. Picture a father wants to demonstrate to the world, or maybe just to his neighbors, let's keep it local. A man wants to demonstrate to his neighbors, to the community in which he lives, his extraordinary love for his son. He wants to show that. And the son reciprocally wants to equally demonstrate or manifest his love for his wonderful father. That's what they want to do. So they want to show the community what this looks like in a visible way. So what happens? The father sends the son into the area to purchase a piece of land. A piece of land that is filled with mud, trash, weeds. How many of you know what Johnson grass is? Remember that kind of clumpy grass that grows up? It survived Katrina. You know, it's that kind of stuff you can't get rid of. This, this junk, 
And so the son buys the worst piece of property in the area. Ronnie, he buys the worst. This is a piece of property that absolutely is worthless as to its ability to produce anything of good to the community. It's a piece of property, Pharaoh, that really in the natural should be just bulldozed and concreted over because it ain't worth a dime. But the son wanting to display the glory, the majesty, the power, the significance of his father's love for him and the father for the, his love for the son does what? Says, buy that piece of property. And so the son goes out and he buys the property. So now what do we have? <clears throat> we have the father owning a piece of property being purchased by the son. So now what happens is the son says, in agreement with the father's will, I'm going to bring in the greatest gardener of all. And I'm going to hire this gardener to cause this garden to become that which is manifestly imaging, declaring of the greatness of this relationship between the father and the son. But it so happens that the gardener is also part of the family, don't you see? So the gardener goes to work pruning, cultivating, digging up, digging out, throwing away, you know, whatever. Now notice, the gardener is not going to get rid of the mud. Why? Because the mud is the very location in which the flowers and the shrubbery and the beautiful trees must grow. But he's going to plant into this mud the seeds, the flowers, the little whatever sap, I don't know what you call this. I'm not much of a gardener. He's going to do this. So he does this and he begins this great venture of cultivation and of pruning, of gardening the garden. And it takes a while. And it's a long process. And it's a process of digging out and planting and continuing to deal with weeds and that come up and, you know, continuing like this. But one day... The gardener is finished, and the son says, now we can go and present this garden fully flowered to the father. And so they do that, and they invite all the neighbors to get on the sidewalk that surround the property, and everybody's on the banquet. We used to call it banquet. And everybody's looking at this garden flowing with all these beautiful flowers and combination of trees and grass and everything so beautiful, just wave. And it's like, look at what this gardener has done in transforming this horrible, worthless piece of property <clears throat> into the most spectacular piece of property in the entire area. Look at it. We stand amazed, wouldn't we? And then the gardener says, well, I want to show you what this property looks like to the father. And so the gardener in some way elevates everybody 60, 70 feet in the air. And he says, now look down at the garden. And everybody looks down to the garden and all of a sudden, oh, my word. We thought it was incredible looking at it at ground level. But now looking at it from the perspective of the Father, what do we see? We see the face of the father's son in the garden. 
That's what God is doing in us. Creating the very face of his own son. Romans 8, 29, that we may be conformed to the image of God's son. And this garden is filled with the planting of the Lord. Fully formed flowers and shrubs of grace. Having overcome all the weeds of sin in our garden. That's what God is doing. And so as we move forward, let's keep that analogy in mind as we begin to look at the descriptives, or if you would, the types of flowers and shrubs that identify and manifest this love of God. So if you hold that analogy, that's what we'll be talking about. So with this picture in mind, let's look at the fruit of Jesus' love that the Spirit produces in us in order to finally form the face of the Father's Son in each of us, the flowers. And so what is Galatians 5.22? The fruit of the Spirit is love, right? Then after that, joy, peace, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's the description of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, this passage begins by telling us that the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit. Now, by the way, who is the one growing the fruit? The, the Spirit is, right? the Holy Spirit. This is fruit that the Spirit produces. Let me remind you again, this is not the fruit that I produce. I cannot produce this fruit. This fruit is planted into me and produced in me and comes to fruition in me by the power of the Holy Spirit who has given me the very nature of the love of God by giving me the Lord Jesus or by planting us into Christ. Amen? So make sure we get this because one of the biggest struggles that Christians have and why so many believers have so much difficulty in living the Christian life and so on is that we are trying to produce the fruit. I can't go into the garden and look at the tree and say, mm, 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 grow. I can't do it. Surely I'm going to wear myself out. I must allow the tree to grow through the normal processes as I cooperate with Mother Nature in nurturing and, and pruning and watering or whatever. So it's the fruit of the Spirit. Now, this passage is divided. I'm going to divide this passage into three forms. First, what is the fruit of the Spirit? Love. Love. That's the fruit of the Spirit. The word is in the Greek karpos. It's singular. It's kind of a, uh, uh, what word, come on, a, a collective noun. It's a noun which is in the singular what, what, that represents more than one thing. So the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Okay, now, the experience of God's love is God's joy. The effect of of God's love in me is God's own peace. And the expression of God's love in me are the rest of the descriptives listed. Patience all the way through self-control. So you see how we're dividing this. Joy is the experience. Peace is the effect and the other six words or the last six descriptives are what? The expression. And so with this analogy in mind, let's know this. How many of you know that in the analogy we use the mud, the mud of our fallen minds, this soil, which is corrupted? And you know when you plant anything in soil, that soil is corrupted. If you, if you do not tend to that plant, that plant will not survive. Isn't that right? Isn't the soil working against your garden? So what has to happen 
in order, one of the, what's one of the most fundamental things that have to happen in order to make the soil be able to be a place of productivity? You have to add what to it? Manure. What? Manure. Manure. Good. <laughs> Nutrients. <laughs> Ingredients. You go up there and you do a lot of stuff and you put stuff out and you have to fertilize it. You just can't go by any soil. Now, Myra, soil is New Orleans for soil. You can't go by any soil and just plant stuff in it. It has to be soil that is compatible for the growth of the plants. Are we, uh, is this news for some of you? Maybe some of you realizing, that's why my rose bush isn't growing. <laughs> By the way, if you have any questions about this, Kevin McGarry is the expert in this class, and he really is. So we know that there has to be ingredients. So what God has done when the Holy Spirit implants the love of God into our hearts. He provides the necessary ingredients, or if you would, creates the necessary atmosphere in which this planting will survive and will not only survive, but will develop and grow. And that's what love, I'm sorry, that's what joy and peace are. These are the two essential ingredients that are in us. Did you hear me? Where is the fruit of the Spirit in us who are saved? Where is it? It's in me. Do we get it? Don't be like others. Oh, I don't know. If you're saved, do you have the fruit of the Spirit in you? Has the love of God been planted into your heart? Beth, has it? Sissy, has it? Yes. Yes, Steve, yes. The love of God has been planted into my heart by the Holy Spirit who has been given to me. Romans 5, 5. We know that. Make sure we know the fundamentals. Because the love of God has been planted into my heart, that means that the joy of God and the peace of God have been given to me as the necessary ingredients which now create the atmosphere and the ability for the soil to produce the fruit. Do we see how this is? Are you connecting today? We need to understand the flow here. So the joy, this joy, what joy? This joy, and we miss it so easily in this. What joy is this? Well, it's the joy that I have in being saved. Well, yes, it is, but not primarily. Whose joy is this? This is the very joy of the Son of God and the Father of the Son that God has. The Holy Spirit has set in me. I have been given, you have been given the very joy that Jesus experiences knowing and relating to the Father and the Holy Spirit, the very joy that the Father has in relating to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, the very joy that the Holy Spirit has in relating to the Father and the Son. We have the very joy of God himself about himself. This is a joy that has been given to us. And because it's been given to us by the Holy Spirit, listen to me what I'm going to say very carefully, and I think it's in your notes. This joy is mine by the gift of grace which we have received by faith, and this joy cannot and never will be removed from us. We cannot lose the joy of God. May I say it louder for you if you need to. I've heard people say, I've lost the joy. You haven't lost the joy. You may have lost some of the experience of the joy, but you ain't lost the joy, brothers and sisters. Why? Because if you've lost the joy, you've lost the Holy Spirit, and if you've lost the Holy Spirit, Jesus has taken him back, and if Jesus has taken him back, the Father has broken his promise. Amen? Amen? Thank you. That's Jonathan back there. Say it again, brother. 
Amen. Listen, listen to this. Jesus 15 and 11 in John, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus' own joy, Stephen, has been given to me and now it becomes mine by a gift. And Jesus is not going to take the gift back, is he? There's a distinction. We're not going to go down this road of having the joy and experiencing the joy. See, John 17, 13, that they may have the full, full measure of my joy. Where? Inside of them. You see, Jesus has not given us some of the joy, David. I'll give you 10%. He's not even given us most of the joy. How much of his joy? We have the very same joy that Jesus has and that the Father has and that the Son has and the Holy Spirit has. We have the very same joy in us, this joy that exists within God in relation to this community of three divine, distinct, equal persons who love, who live who live in an atmosphere and the relational roles of loving one another. We have the joy. We have the joy. Do you remember the announcement of the angels in Luke chapter 2, the shepherd out there in the fields? And he says what? Behold, I bring you good or great news, good news of a what? Of a great joy, which shall be, in other words, be given to the people. What great joy. God's joy in giving us his joy through the gift of his son. God's own joy over giving us his joy. Think about it. Christmas morning, all of you who have children. How many of you know your children were filled with joy to get presents? Come on. How many of you know that? Can you, can anybody in here? Can, you can raise your hands. It's a Pentecostal church, supposedly. It's, amen. Hallelujah. Thank God. Praise Jesus. I mean, River, when you receive presents, did you re get joy? When David, hope you, David gives you a present. <laughs> I'm taking a chance here. But when David gives you something, do you experience joy? Who, however, experiences the greater joy, the children or the ones who give it to them? I do, the daddy, the grandpa. I receive so much more joy than they ever have because it is, it is they are receiving me and rejoicing over me. Don't you see that in your gift? And that is the greatest compliment I can have that Gene can have as a nana, that Linda can have over John Michael, et cetera. Our joy in the joy of our children, parents, whoever. Don't you see this? And so when the angel said, I bring you good news of a what? A great joy. Oh, yes, it's a joy that has been given to us. But why is it great? Because it is the great joy of a great father in the giving of his own son. It is that joy, the father's overflowing joy that watch my children be blessed when I give them the gift of my son by the Holy Spirit. That's the joy of heaven. Let us not make the joy primarily about me, what I get. It is what I get, but it's the Father's joy over giving me that gift over which I can now rejoice. That's why joyfulness and thankfulness and gratitude and giving of tithes and so on is so critical because it says something about the joy and the gift of this great Father of ours. That's why we should never withhold from God. It's about God. 
this joy is called the, in, in, in Nehemiah 8.10, I won't go into the background, but he calls it the joy is what? Is this, I've forgotten that verse now. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Strength. How many of you know this? That when you are experiencing joy, now think, you're experiencing joy. How many of you know that the circumstances which you face are more easily dealt with? But if you're not experiencing joy, what happens to you when you're facing difficulties? What happens? You're having a very difficult time. And so what does the enemy want to do? He wants to cause us first to think I've lost the joy, but that ain't happening, brothers and sisters. But he at least wants us to have a lessening experience of the joy. So he'll send in all kind of stuff. And to the extent that we keep our eyes on this and worry about that or whatever, we will begin to have the experience of joy diminish. We must fight for joy. We must keep our eyes on the Father's joy over us as his own children. Amen? Amen. Yes. Peace. The effect, the effect. When the Holy Spirit did a work in my life, the first thing I said was this, and talking about the Bible being the Word of God, the first thing came out of my mouth, it's all true. That's the first thing that came out of my mouth. The second thing that came out of my mouth and I didn't even understand the theology, but I understood the effect. I said this. I said this. The war is over. The war in myself, about myself, over myself. The war of self. Anything and everything about self. I said, I got up and I said, the war is over. It was like a monumental rock had been lifted from my shoulders and I felt God's peace. I could not have told you it was the peace of the Holy Spirit because I didn't know that much. But I do know that it was peace. And the radical change that came over me because peace had been declared, the enmity between God and me, Jesus solved at the cross, remember? And so Romans 5, 1, having been justified or declared not guilty by faith, we received that declaration, having been justified by faith, what? We what? It doesn't say may. We what? Come on, come on, come on. We what? Have, right? When, 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 when? Right now, have, have. <clears throat> peace we have. It will never be given or taken away. Jesus says, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. We have the peace of God. The primary war and struggle is over. We are the children of God, beloved of God now. And it does matter about what is happening in the world. It does matter about the contention and the anger and the hatred and, hatred and the uh, 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 racism and the uh, uh, bigotry and, and the financial, all this. It does matter, but it has nothing to do with our peace with God. Do not let the issues of this world begin to even remotely attain the place we're at peace no matter what happens no matter who is in office or who isn't in office no matter what laws are passed or not passed none of that none of that has anything to do with our peace with God because we are the children of God we are the living kingdom of God in the kingdom of this world and we are the ones who are to declare through our obedience to the Lord and submission to the Holy Spirit the great flower garden of God which is greater than all the weeds of our sin and the weeds of the world. Amen? Amen. Peace. 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 Total sovereignty. T 
told of whatever is happening in this world, you must remember. Thank you, Cody. You must remember at every moment and every decision and every word and every activity, God is the one leading and these people and we too much don't know it and we need to remember that. We can be at perfect peace in the midst of the worst storm on earth. You see, this is the peace that is to guard our hearts and to govern our hearts, Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God. We have peace with God. Now the peace of God, this peace that exists within the Trinity, this is the peace that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit experience as a community of three divine persons. It is the settlement, the lack of strife, no disagreement, complete oneness and harmony. This is the peace. This is that shalom, that welfare, that God is in himself. This is the peace that we have been given. This peace, God's own peace in me. And so that peace begins to develop and we begin to experience more and more the effect and the control and the guarding of our hearts by this peace. So the peace of God which transcends all of our natural understandings will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. So where is this peace? Where is this joy? Where is it now? He has given it to us. How? Because we have the Holy Spirit. Peace and joy are not things. Peace and joy are essential attributes of God's love. Remember, God has not given us a thing. He's given us himself in the Holy Spirit. So we now have the transcendent, eternal, sovereign trinity of God living in us. That's who we are now, amen, as the children of God. And to the extent that Jesus owned joy and peace, when I emphasize Jesus because he was in the, the incarnate son, but it's the Holy Spirit's joy and peace and the Father's joy and peace. You understand that. To the extent that Jesus owned peace and joy, um, let me say, it is the own, Jesus' own joy and peace that gives us the ability to walk with God obediently, confidently, steadily, faithfully as the fruit of the Spirit has grown in us. Peace and joy are the necessary ingredients. And when you find yourself having real difficulty in, you know, seeing and obeying God and the fruit of the Spirit is having real, the place you look is not to ask God, give me more give me more peace or, I mean, uh, give me more patience, give me more kindness. That, you're missing the mark. Cause your joy and peace to guard and to rule over, to permeate me in a way that I will be able to experience the joy and the peace in me so that I can walk confidently with the Holy Spirit and in the Holy Spirit in order to become the flower garden of God. Amen. Amen. This is, these are the first two facets that cause the, the soil to be able to bring forth the planting of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. See you next Sunday.